Uh, hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today we're going to look at a mass spectrometer problem. A mass spectrometer typically consists of three parts. Uh, the first part here is an accelerator. The accelerator basically just gets charges to move. So we're going to accelerate them, we're going to produce a, an electric field, and that's going to get charges to, uh, to get going. Uh, the second part of the mass spectrometer is a velocity selector. Now typically once they come out of the accelerator you could have different isotopes moving at different speeds. Uh, and what you want to do now is basically just have a device that'll select just one speed. For example, 5,000 meters per second, 300 meters per second. I only want kind of all the different particles of different types to come out at the same speed. And the last part of it is actually the mass spectrometer part. Here we use a magnetic field and charges in a magnetic field will go around in a circular path. Um, and what the next section does is it will actually separate out the different isotopes so you can see how much, uh, what the relative concentration is of each. So we're going to look at the physics of each section. We're going to take an example using a nickel, um, nickel atom and we're going to ionize it and put it through this mass spectrometer, look at three different stages. All right, let's get started. All right, so let's first look at the accelerator region. Uh, typically there's a chamber that's placed before the accelerator, some ionization chamber. And what we do here is inside this ionization chamber, we might place a gas, for example, that might contain different isotopes of nickel. We're gonna focus our attention on nickel 58 here. Uh, nickel has 28 protons, and the neutral atom clearly has 28 electrons. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna remove one electron. And we're gonna remove one electron, which means that all of these atoms here that have been ionized are basically going to have a positive charge because I've removed the electron. And they're gonna have a positive charge equal to plus E. Now the different isotopes are going to have different masses, but that's okay, they're all gonna have the same charge. And if you remember what this elementary charge is, it's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. All right, the next step now is, what you wanna do is you want some of these atoms to enter a region over here, which is what the accelerator is. Basically we have two parallel plates what we do now is we're going to connect those plates to a power supply. In this particular case, I'm going to take a potential difference equal to 3,000 volts between those plates. Uh, the first plate is positively charged, the second one is negatively charged, and you see why in a minute, because my nickel here has a positive charge. And what I want to do now is I'm producing a potential difference which basically produces an electric field between these plates that goes from the positive to the negative plate. Now when you do that, remember there's a force acting on the charge, and the force acting on the charge will be the magnitude of the charge multiplied by the magnitude of the electric field. So that means on this nickel atom over here, there's going to be a force that is going to accelerate that particular charge. If you think about this in terms of energy now, it means initially what you have is a lot of electrical potential energy, and you're going to convert that into kinetic energy which is going to speed up this atom. So let's go ahead and use conservation of energy in order to calculate what is the speed when you exit this field region over here. Now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna assume that when the particle first kind of enters this accelerator region, that the initial velocity is small, okay? And you're gonna see that when it exits, that it could actually be quite large for a 3,000 volts difference between uh, the positive and the negative plate. So let's assume that the initial velocity is small, which means initially it has very little kinetic energy. It's all electrical potential energy. All right, so the way you look, like, you look, way you look at this problem now is you say, what is the initial energy? And you compare that to the final energy. All right, initially I'm gonna have some kinetic plus some electrical potential energy. That has to be equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final electrical potential energy. All right, initial kinetic energy, we just said that one is going to be basically small or zero in this particular case. And my final kinetic energy is simply one half mv squared. All right, I'll bring the u final to the other side. So here we have u initial minus u final. Now how do you calculate the potential energy? Well remember this is u initial minus u final. If you remember one equation here, how do you relate the potential energy to the electrical potential? It's basically simply the charge multiplied by the potential. 
In this case, our charge is that elementary charge, so this will look like this. It's E multiplied by the initial voltage minus the charge multiplied by the final voltage. And this here has to be equal to 1 half mv squared. All right, here you can factor out the E and you basically have V initial minus V final has to be equal to 1 half mv squared. All right, if you have a look at the term in the bracket over here, this is basically just negative the change in potential. This is our 3000 volts here that we have between the plates, right? The difference between the initial and the final is 3000 volts. So the only unknown here really in this expression is the speed. So let's go ahead and just isolate. So you bring the two on the other side, you divide by the mass. And what you end up getting is that our velocity, you can write it as the square root. Now there's a whole bunch of terms here. There's two multiplied by the charge. Again, sometimes you could just write the magnitude of delta V here. And also divided by the mass. So we can actually calculate what is the speed of a nickel uh, atom that has a a uh, positive charge because I've removed the outer electron from this ionization chamber. So what is the speed of this outgoing nickel atom? So let's go ahead and get an actual number for that. All you have to do now is simply substitute. I've given you the mass up here. The mass of nickel 58 that I'm going to consider is 9.62 times 10 to the negative 26. So you punch everything in the calculator. 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 multiplied by 3,000. And again, divided by this mass, 9.62 times 10 to the negative 26. Uh, at the end of the day, the speed of this outgoing charge here uh, that we're going to calculate is going to be approximately 10,000 meters per second. That's pretty fast, right? <laughs> All right, so that's the first part is the accelerator. All right, here's the second part is the velocity selector. Again, we had this nickel atom here, which we calculated coming out of 10,000 meters per second. In reality, however, there is really a distribution. If you plot the number of particles coming out at a particular velocity, maybe most of them are coming out at approximately 10,000, but you have different isotopes in there which have different masses, so you could actually have a spread of values. But let's first consider this one. Uh, the velocity selector is really depicted all the way on the right hand side. It's a region here that contains an electric field and also a magnetic field B. Those vectors are actually perpendicular to each other. And let's look at their effect individually and then we'll combine them to get the total velocity selector. So the first image shows you a velocity selector with only an electric field. Now remember, if you have an electric field and I have a charge, remember our charge is given by the elementary charge, E, uh, you're going to have a force, right? The force is simply given by the charge multiplied by the magnitude of the field. Now the direction in this case is going to be in the direction of the electric field, and the electric field points up, which means that you would have a force on this charge acting up. Well, what that would do now is that it would lead to a deflection, right? Because there's force upward. As soon as it enters the field region, it's getting deflected toward the negative plate. That's where this positive charge wants to go. It wants, it's being repelled by all of these positive charges and going toward the negative charges. All right, now, what if I only had a magnetic field? Okay, what if I only had a magnetic field and I have a charged particle that enters this field region? For this one here, you have to use the right-hand rule to find the direction of the force. So let's first look at the right-hand rule again, just to refresh our memory. The right-hand rule is used to find the direction of a magnetic force. The magnetic force is given by Q, the charge, multiplied by the vector V, the velocity, and that's a cross product with the magnetic field. All right, so to use the right-hand rule, number one, most important, use your right hand. <laughs> Here's the rule down below. And we're dealing with positive charges here, so we're gonna do this. First step of the right-hand rule says, you place your fingers along the velocity vector. In this case, here's our nickel. We place our right hand. Notice that kinda of have to contort my body a little bit, but you place your fingers along that V vector. Next thing, your palm has to be toward the second vector. The second vector in this equation here is our magnetic field vector, and that vector is going out of the page. So notice that the right hand is oriented so that the palm points out of the page. And the last part is simply that your thumb gives you the direction of the force. So notice that my thumb here is acting in the downward direction. 
that is the direction of the magnetic force acting on this charge. Which means that when you first enter the field region, and if something is pushing you down, you're going to start deflecting down. Actually, the problem with this right-hand rule now is not really a problem, but one of the consequences is that now that my velocity will change direction. So that the force is constantly going to change direction, but initially it's going to go down. All right, so let's go back to our velocity selector. All right, now if I enter a region where there's only a magnetic field, we just saw there's going to be a magnetic force and that magnetic force is gonna be acting in the down direction. What that's going to do when this charge enters the region is it's going to curve it downward. All right, so we have an electric force acting up. We have a magnetic force and the magnitude of this force now, this is the charge multiplied by the speed multiplied by the magnetic field magnitude. There's sometimes also an angular term here, but in this case it's 90 degrees, so sine of 90 degrees equals to one, so I'm not even going to include it here. All right, so this is kind of really important actually. This magnetic force depends on how fast the particle is moving. The electric force doesn't, right? It really only depends on two terms, how big the field is and the charge. Now what happens now if these forces balance each other? Right? If the forces balance each other, so if I place them now in this actual velocity selector and I tune the electric field, right? I have control of this. I can basically just increase the power supply to make the field bigger, right? And that's all I gotta do. So I can really control this, I can tune this, or I can change the magnitude of the magnetic field. So if the forces actually balance, you have the same number of forces acting up as acting down, what you end up getting here is this balance. So the electric force would be equal to the magnetic force. And what would happen is, if this happens, this nickel atom here will simply move undeflected if these forces are balanced. It'll simply move right through that velocity selector and it won't get deflected. But however, that's only going to happen if this condition here is satisfied. And actually you see that the charge is actually on both sides. And as long as the velocity of that particle is equal to this ratio right here, only particles where this is satisfied are going to move undeflected. If, and again, I get to pick these values, right? This is the, uh, the apparatus that I'm using will set the electric field and set the magnetic field. So for example, if I wanted to get a velocity selector of 10,000 meters per second, well, one way of doing it would set a magnetic field equal to 0.12 Tesla. And if my electric field is equal to 1200 newtons per coulomb, at the end of the day, what I'm gonna end up getting over here is a velocity selector. Again, if you do the math here, this is 1200 divided by 0.12, what I'm going to get at the end is really a stream of particles over here that are really moving at 10,000 meters per second. So this distribution here is going to get much narrower, and which means that different isotopes, right, I only considered uh, nickel 58, but I could have nickel 60, for example, coming into this velocity selector, and at the end, I'm gonna have both of these different isotopes moving at the exact same speed at the 10,000 meters per second. All right, let's move on to the mass spectrometer part now. I showed you previously how to use the right-hand rule in order to calculate the direction of the force, and we basically did this top case over here. So the mass spectrometer has a field region which is kind of limited in size and space. Right, and now we're gonna have all of these particles entering the field region here from the left and entering the field region with a velocity that's pointing directly to the right. In this case, it's going to be 10,000 meters per second. We calculated or we showed you how to use the right-hand rule to find the direction of this force. However, what happens now, right? If you have a force acting on this charge, basically what that does is it will make it deflect. However, if it starts to deflect, it means that the velocity now changes directions. At some point, it's going to be like this. And now there's still a force acting on it. If you redo the right-hand rule over here, you're gonna find a force acting like this, and which means it's going to continue deflecting. At some point, actually, the velocity of the particle is going to be straight down. And in that case, the magnetic force 
FB is pointing directly to the left. So if I have a charged particle moving down and I have a force pointing to the left, it's going to continue deflecting. Right? At every point, I could redo the right-hand rule. And what I should find actually at the end is a particle or a trajectory that is actually circular. Okay? Charged particles that move in magnetic fields move in circular paths with a particular radius. Okay, so this is really the key to this next section of the mass spectrometer part. So we have our charged particles that have exited our velocity selector moving at 10,000 meters per second. And now they're going to enter a region where there is only a magnetic field. Okay, there's no more electric field over here. And in this case, let's consider a magnetic field again equal to the same value as the velocity selector of 0.12 Tesla. I just showed you now that the trajectory has to be circular and we get that from the right hand rule. And that's because our force is always perpendicular to the velocity. That's point number one. When you have a force that's perpendicular to velocity, it means that the force does not change the speed. It will only change the direction of the velocity as you go around this circular path. This is an example of centripetal motion, of uniform circular motion. Okay, no change in speed. If you think about it in terms of energy and work, forces that don't change the speed basically don't change the kinetic energy, which means they don't do any work on the charge. And this is very important. Now, if you go anywhere on this trajectory and I plot what the force is, force, for example, at this point is pointing toward the center of the circle, you apply Newton's second law to this, you say, well, the magnitude of the force is EVB, and that must be equal to the mass times the acceleration. Except now the acceleration is our centripetal acceleration. If you go back to an earlier chapter, you should remember centripetal acceleration is velocity squared divided by the radius of that path. If you look at our equation over here, we have velocity on both sides. I'm going to cancel one of these. Let's get rid of it. And my goal now is to find what is really this radius of the path that I'm going to take. Then that's the located over here in the denominator. So let's just rearrange this expression. So we have R is equal to MV divided by E times B. Now have a look, does this equation make sense? If the mass is big, the radius is big. Yeah, if the mass is big, it means it has a lot of inertia. It means it wants to keep going in a straight line. That'll lead to a big radius. If the velocity is big, actually, yeah, that one will kind of penetrate deeper into this field region, right? It's kind of zooming in. There's a force on it, but still the velocity will tend to make the radius bigger. If the charge or the field are big, that means that the magnetic force is really big, and that's going to tend to make the radius smaller. Now, if we go ahead and do this for uh, this particular case, so let's calculate our radius for uh, nickel. Uh, this was nickel 58. So nickel 58 had our mass here, which was 9.62 times 10 to the negative 26. Uh, the velocity now was 10,000 uh, divided by the charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And our magnetic field is still 1, uh, 0 0.12 Tesla. So the radius here that I calculate was 0 0.05, and that's in meters. Uh, convert that to centimeters, we get Five centimeters is our path for these atoms. So what you could do here is you could place a detector here. And as long as it's located five centimeters or 10 centimeters away from where the charge enters, right? Because that's the full diameter over here. Uh, you're going to locate a whole bunch of particles that are going to be nickel 58. You typically use a mass spectrometer to separate out different isotopes of a particular atom. For example, we just did the calculation now for nickel 58. We obtain a radius equal to five centimeters. What if now we had also coming out of our velocity selector, we had some nickel 60. Now the mass of nickel 60, let's go ahead and calculate that. And let's just assume that it's just uh, the mass ratio. And again, this is simply multiplied by 9.62 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. All right, should be a little bit heavier because it has those two additional uh, neutrons in there. So again, we can actually reuse our formula now for the radius and actually calculate what would be the radius if I had a different isotope. In this case, it'll be nickel 60. 
All right, plug in this new mass inside our formula. What you end up getting now is six centimeters. And that makes sense, right? Nickel 60 is a little bit heavier. If it's entering the same field region, you'd expect it to have a slightly bigger circle over here. And that means that at the end of the day, we're going to have some separation here, some delta in the radius, because our masses are different. Now the charges are going to be the same if I've removed only one electron. Both of these isotopes have the same charge, but just the fact that they have different masses means that we're going to have a separation over here that I can detect with a detector over here. So I can know what the relative concentration is. So in this case here, the delta in the radius or the separation that I'm going to find here, uh, again, is going to be just the difference here. We're gonna have one centimeter separation, uh, which is basically just 10 millimeters. Okay, so you can use a device like this in order to separate out the different isotopes. Uh, and again, they're gonna be coming in here at the same speed because of our velocity selector. All right, thanks for watching, folks.